Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. We like to be punctual with all of you. I'm Lori Ward, and I have the best job in the world, I believe, and um, I am CEO at Washington's National Park Fund. For me, it's kind of unbelievable. I'm coming upon 10 years in the position, and I still love, love, love the work. It's a, as you can imagine, it's a real privilege to work with these three national parks. Uh, we've been growing strong year after year. We had a great year last year in spite of it all. Our national parks were hit pretty hard by increased visitorship, but like they always do, they ebb and tide, ebb and flow with the, the increases and adapt as they go. Washington's National Park Fund has a really strong board of 23 individuals who give of their time, talents, and treasures throughout the year, um, very passionate group. We have a strong and competent staff of seven. Uh, the superintendents provide their park priority projects to us at the beginning of the year. These are things that without philanthropic support would go unfunded and not happen. And uh, every year we're giving more and more. So, you know, it's just a treat. Our vision is to see parks that are strong and vibrant, that are youthful and everlasting. Before we begin a few housekeeping, tips. The trip's 45 minutes, a uh, 30-minute presentation from our friend Jeff Antonellis Lapp, and then some time at the end for Q&A. As we go through, if you have questions you'd like to put in the Q&A box, feel free to. We will address them at the end of the field trip. Uh, if you need closed captioning, it's available to all of you. If you have it and you'd rather turn it off, you can easily do that by clicking on the closed captioning button down at the bottom. Uh, let's see, we like feedback on these as we continue to develop them throughout the year. So be in touch with us, you'll, you'll see information and reach out to us, just let us know what your thoughts are. So with that, is your pack ready? Are your boots on? <laughs> are you ready to jump on the bus and travel on up to Mount Rainier National Park with all of us? Jeff and Tellus Lapp graduated and worked in Mount Rainier National Park for a few years. That ignited a connection that he has to this very day to the mountain. Um, and he has summited the mountain. He's hiked all of its mapped trails. He's done the Wonderland Trail, 93 mile Wonderland Trail five times, beautiful. Uh, he's, he began writing a book that, that is a dandy, Tahoma and its people uh, after being unable to find current information, natural history about the parks, he was teaching at Evergreen State College in Olympia. He conducted over 250 days of field work for the book, uh, many of them in the company of park archaeologists, uh, biologists, and geologists. He knows the park well. While at Evergreen, he taught Native American studies, uh, natural history, environmental education and served as the library dean before retiring. And in my opinion, he looks far too young to retire uh, in 2015. Jeff, with that, I turn it over to you and you can take it away, my friend. Great. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Lori. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, thanks also to Casey, <clears throat> who um, behind the scenes gave me the invitation and does a lot of the tech work for us behind the scenes. So hello, everybody. Welcome. Great to be with you, uh, to be with some of you again. I gave a separate talk on Mount Rainier last year. We've got a completely different one today. And so uh, let's get with it. Um, so as Lori said, um, have some comfortable uh, walking shoes, grab your lunch, and uh, please get onto the bus. And uh, on our way up to paradise, I'm going to give you an introduction, tell you a few stories and get things started. Most of what I'm gonna talk with you about is from my natural history of Mount Rainier called Tahoma and its people. It was published last year by Washington State University Press. And you might know Tahoma is one of the Native American names for the mountain. And if you'd like me to talk more about that, by all means, I'll put that question uh, into the question and answer feature. We'll get to that at the end of the talk. As we cruise up to paradise here on the bus, I always like to uh, begin my talks by giving some recognition to a couple of groups of people that have been so important to me uh, over the years. I taught on Indian reservations in Western Washington for a number of years and the people there were so kind to me that they let me, uh, they allowed me to study the language and um, 
excuse me just a second, I'm catching up with you. They allowed me to study the language. Uh, I studied uh, Lashutzi, actually the Southern dialect, which is called Fulshutzi. Echaf siyaya, echaf siyaya. Hello, friends. And because folks were also very kind to me, they shared lots of cultural knowledge. They taught me how to gather Western red cedar bark. Uh, how to work with it. I actually learned to do some cedar bark weaving. And these experiences, I think, helped me be prepared to learn and tell the stories from them, to learn to tell the stories of their ancestors and their lives uh, at Tahoma over the ages. The other group of folks so uh, helpful to me, of course, is Laurie and Tomato, were the men and women with the National Park Service, particularly scientists and staff at Mount Rainier. These folks uh, drug me onto the Nisqually Glacier uh, to help take measurements. Uh, I know a lot about climate change at Mount Rainier. I don't talk a lot about it in this talk here, but if you'd like to know more or the status of the glaciers, by all means, again, ask that at the end of the talk. And I was also able to help out at several archeological excavations. And what we know now is that native people have been going to Mount Rainier for over 9,000 years. That's a long time. And I'll talk a little bit about that as we meet the original inhabitants of the Nisqually watershed. So, so many stories to tell, as you can imagine. But today, let's just call this talk, let's call this the virtual field trip in the Nisqually watershed. And here's a shot looking up the Nisqually watershed from Rick Secker Point. So we're within Mount Rainier National Park. That is the Nisqually Bridge there that you see in the center of the photograph. We'll be crossing it shortly in our bus, crossing the Squally River on our way up to Paradise. You can think of today's talk as kind of an adventure from Alpine Heights to the Salish Sea, or if you want to think of it in terms of organisms from mountain goats to gooey ducks. But first, an overview of the uh, watershed. We're going to start where the river starts at the terminus of the Nisqually Glacier here, and we're going to follow the river. 78 miles through these small towns, through the corridor, and we're going to end at Billy Frank Jr. Nisqually National Wildlife Refuge. That's where the Nisqually empties into Puget Sound. But as I said, let's first meet and learn a little bit about the original inhabitants, the Duf Squally Opsh, Duf Squally Opsh, people of the grass, people of the river, the Nisqually people who have been in this watershed for thousands of years. And although there are no known year-round villages that we know of within the boundaries of Mount Rainier National Park, there is at least one uh, year-round village close to the park boundary. And then here are a few of the other ancestral villages of the Nisqually, one below the uh, Legrand uh, and Alder Dams, uh, an important one at Michelle where the Michelle River runs into uh, the Nisqually. This village was especially important because it was the birthplace of Willie Frank. He was a father of Billy Frank Jr. And Willie was like a cultural bridge between the 19th and 20th centuries. Uh, he grew up in this village and he knew so much of the life ways of the Puyallup and the Squally people. And he was willing to talk about it with ethnographers and other historians. So Willie was a great treasure in that regard. And then a couple of villages on either side of the Nisqually River, uh, river mouth where it empties into the sound. Now, no year-round villages uh, inside uh, the park in terms of the Nisqually people, but a really important archeological site, basically a summer camp here. This is, uh, if you have ever been up to Indian Henry's hunting ground, this is just a couple of miles from Indian Henry's. If you have ever stopped at the Couts Creek picnic area, uh, you've also been just a few miles from this spot. So when the snows melted back, people would come here in summer and go to over a hundred other spots on the mountain in the summertime usually. And the Nisqually people, probably here because it's in the Nisqually watershed, ancestors of Nisqually people would set up camp here. And the important person to point out here in the unit actually doing the work is Greg Burchard, now retired, but really important part of the development of the park's archeological record. Greg himself added over 30 sites to the park's archeological record, R just amazing work. I want you to notice most of the rest of us, including yours truly here, uh, in the standard loafer pose, hands on hips. And uh, Greg was a real worker, loved to do the work and loved to get into it. 
So uh, here's a shot, same, same area. In the background, I want to point out to you that this is Ben Diaz, who is now the park's archaeologist. And Ben continues to be the tribal liaison with local tribes in the area uh, involving them in various archaeological projects. So why did people come? Why did people come to the mountain? Probably for a variety of reasons, but we know they came for resources. They came to hunt things like mountain goats or marmots. They came to collect plants for medicinal or technological purposes. And they really came also for huckleberries, a very important source of vitamin C that was a critical part of early Native American diets. So these were some of the reasons that people came into uh, the high country. So now that we're up at Paradise, let's just stroll out to the Nisqually Vista Trail. And you can do this on any day. You can even snowshoe out here. But on a beautiful day like today, we can take a look at up the Nisqually Valley. And you can see here where the river itself originates, right at the terminus of the glacier. Notice this huge U-shaped U -shaped valley carved out by the glacier. Imagine it with hundreds and hundreds of ice and snow deep in this area. And again, please ask me about the status of the glaciers if you like when we get to the Q&A. Here's a close up. So here's the river beginning. That big pile to the right is actually the glacier. It just happens to be covered with rock debris. So let's hop over from the terminus, actually the beginning of our field trip. Let's take a quick trip to paradise. And this is one of the main reasons that people come to Mount Rainier. It's for the flower fields, the incredible extravaganza of wildflowers uh, every summer, uh, usually early to mid-August. Hard to pin down when it's going to happen some years. But uh, you probably have also heard of the work of the University of Washington research team. They're finding that there are plots of wildflowers up there that are now blooming earlier in the season and staying open for longer periods of time. Now, that sounds like good news for visitors who want to see the wildflowers. But when you consider there's a very highly evolved, intricate pattern of pollination between the wildflowers and pollinators like bumblebees, other insects, two species of hummingbirds. If that could set out a balance, we're not real sure what's gonna to happen to the wildflowers or to other pollinators. So all the years of this beauty, these wildflowers, wildlife that are attracting people to paradise. And over the years, you might know that, you know, with that comes human impact. So with over the years, uh, there was a downhill skiing operation at Paradise for over 40 years. There was a tent camping business where you could actually camp in the meadow. Uh, probably one of the most devastating damages to the park's meadows uh, was the pony rides concession, both at Paradise and at Sunrise. Uh, they left huge trenches, a couple feet wide and 10 feet, 10 feet deep. I'm just the horrible scars in the landscape 30 years after the last pony left paradise. Um, what that triggered was a fabulous restoration program where plants are now grown in the park's greenhouse uh, over the winter months. And then every year, these are volunteers and there's jobs for you also as volunteers at Mount Rainier. These are volunteers that every year help put plants in the ground to restore the meadows uh, at paradise and other places on the mountain. Another thing that grew out of the park's metal restoration program was the discovery that uniformed personnel really help keep people from trampling the meadows. So they created the meadow rover program. And these are folks actually working at Sunrise, mostly retired folks, often teachers who spend the summer ambling through the meadows, interacting with visitors and giving them the good word about staying on the trails and off the meadows. So let's roll down the mountain a little bit. This is a stop I want to turn you on to. This is just above the Cougar Rock Campground. And can you see the car that's on the roadway right beneath the Van Trump Creek sign? So we're at Van Trump Creek. And, and quickly, what's going on here? When the road was built, it was about 30 feet higher than the creek bed. Now, one of the normal things that happens with rivers that flow from glaciers is they carry sediment with them. You knew that. And so this is called aggradation, this gradual accumulation of sediment in the riverbeds. And at Mount Rainier, it was pretty gradual through most of the last century. 
But then park geologist Scott Beeson made a pretty startling discovery. He found on average about three feet of sediment was accumulating in Mount Rainier's rivers. Three feet, an increase by a factor of nine. Why? Well, think of the ice and snow as glue on the upper mountain. And as it melts and deteriorates, more and more rock debris is available for downslope transport. When that happens, it fills in areas like this, and it leaves less place for water to come in a high water event. And that was nothing was truer than that than in the floods in 2006. This is the Longmire maintenance area. It, the, the flood almost took the emergency operations command center downriver. Now that would have made the news. So in addition to flooding as a result of increased aggradation rates, we can also have a sudden release of water, ice, and rock debris known as debris flows or glacial outburst floods. And if we move down the park road a little bit toward the park entrance at Nisqually and go up the west side road, we can see Tahoma Creek here was once a mild-mannered skinny little creek. Now look how it's just gotten wider. See those ghost trees, those dead trees? They didn't grow up in the creek. The creek has expanded to engulf them and drown them. The park became concerned that the creek was going to take over the west side road. All these debris flows over the years, millions of cubic yards of debris, enough to fill a couple of lines of dump trucks, bumper to bumper, all the way to New York City. So with that concern, the park decided to take action. And here's a, a really landmark project. This excavator is actually on the west side road. The creek would be to your left. And it's digging out to put into place these log bundles. These things are amazing. What they do is when the flow is restored to the creek, it slows down the creek's flow, allows sediment to drop. And if you can imagine the grade of the riverbed changing so that the creek or the river actually starts to move away from the road and protect it. Another cool thing they did here was they installed uh, uh, alder and willow sticks, basically, of what they call a, a willow wattle, and that helps to hold the uh, roadway in place and the bank alongside in place. And all of this is still, years later, is still operational and doing a good job. So let's leave the park. We've been here. We're going to go down to Eatonville and check out a project here. Do you see that? But on the way, let's make sure we pay attention to the 2,700 acres preserved in perpetuity as part of the Mount Rainier Gateway, that we pay attention to the largest community owned forest in the state of Washington. And these are just two of the projects of the Nisqually Land Trust. Uh, the trust stewards thousands of acres. They protect over 75% of the Nisqually River shoreline now. So that's shoreline, riverside shoreline that will never be developed. It's preserved in perpetuity. And they're in really good cahoots, really good work with the Nisqually River Council, oldest river council west of the Mississippi River. And here's one of the projects they've done together outside of Eatonville. This is a different kind of structure. These engineered log jams are great to stop erosion, flooding, and also terrific habitat for migrating salmonids. Let's keep scooting down. Let's go from Eatonville. Here we are. Let's go from Eatonville down to Joint Base Lewis McCord. You might be familiar with this huge base. US Army and US Air Force operate between Olympia and Tacoma. Did you know that it sits on some ancient prairie that once ran all the way from Canada to Oregon, over 300 miles? And did you know that habitat loss were down to just a few percent of the original prairies? And of course, huge impact on the plant species. 46 last count are on various watch lists and endangered and threatened lists. And about half of the bird species have really suffered as well. So how to preserve what's, what's left? That's the question, right? What, how do we keep what's left? Ironically, believe it or not, the best way is to allow the military to continue their exercises because most of these native prairie plants respond well to low intensity fires that are produced by these exploding shells. And it's much better, you gotta admit, than a housing development or a strip mall. This is also ground zero for some great projects. Uh, one concerns the Taylor's checker spot butterfly, once abundant on the prairies, 
uh, in big trouble now, but there's an amazing project in play between the Washington Department of Corrections and the Evergreen State College. It's called Sustainability in Prisons Project. And these incarcerated people and others have raised over 18,000 larvae and adult Taylor checker spots that then get transplanted out into the Nisqually prairies. They're making a comeback. And these women are really affected in a good way by the work that they do on behalf of the checker spots. It's a really cool story. Um, on the uh, systems level, he, he, the nasty Scotch broom, right? What can you say about Scotch broom? Uh, it's beautiful, but it's invasive and it just doesn't know when to quit. So at Joint Base Lewis McCord, trying to deal with the entire system, what do we do? Well, mowing and mowing and mowing, but also using fire, prescribed burns to eradicate unwanted invasives. Crews are burning on average about 1800 acres a year over the last decade. And this helps keep out unwanted, like you see Scott's broom in the foreground, and even Doug fir, although it's native, it will take over a prairie and turn into a Doug fir forest. Lots of evidence that Native Americans used fire on their behalf to also uh, uh, encourage the growth of certain prairie plants that they wanted and to keep others out. A another part of the picture, again, with the Sustainability in Prisons Project is raising plants, native plants, amazing stuff they've done over the years. Uh, this many plants and this many species that have been uh, raised in their nursery program, a real groundbreaking project, if you don't mind my pun. So people raising violets. Let's take one last trip back on the bus, everybody. Grab your stuff. We're going to go from here down to the refuge now. Here's a look at the Nisqually Delta. This is where the river completes its, its run of 78 miles. Uh, I-5 in your foreground, Olympia would be to your left, to the south, Tacoma and Seattle would be to your right, to the north. This incredible productive area with millions and millions of organisms in just a, a square meter of mud and muck. Uh, one of the last vestiges of salt marsh habitat in this part of the world. And if we look at the Delta through the ages, we might think of it as having started in a natural condition thousands of years ago, then Nisqually villages coming to be uh, in the mid 19th century, some uh, European American families settled the area. Uh, the Treaty of Medicine Creek was signed here near the Delta uh, in 1854. Uh, and then in the early 1900s, Seattle lawyer Alson Brown had a vision for a large scale farming operation. First thing he did was he hired a crew and they diked, they built a dike uh, so that it would drain and give good farming conditions. Uh, but it also was a real death knell to the Nisqually River. It cut it off from uh, its ancestral path into Puget Sound. But the area caught a huge break in 1974 when it was designated the National Wildlife Refuge, making it one of the few rivers we know of that begins in a national park and ends in a National Wildlife Refuge. Caught another big break in the early 2000s when the Nisqually Indian Tribe and a bunch of other groups and organizations came together, raised the funds and get the permits to actually remove the five miles of dike. They restored hundreds of acres of estuary to its original condition. I've circled the barns here, if you're familiar with those in the right-hand side of the photo as a point of reference, Here's the area with the dike still in play. Here's a photograph, same area with the dike gone. Notice the new pathways between the river to the right and Puget Sound to the left. One more time from here to here. Pretty good stuff. So helping to return the Nisqually a bit to its natural condition, I think, moving back that way. And as we start to wrap up the field trip, if we were to think of one person who best embodies the grit, the determination, the great projects uh, in the Nisqually watershed, for me, it's gotta be Billy Frank Jr. You might know him as a, a Nisqually tribal leader. He was an activist at the local, state, federal levels, uh, was even awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by President Barack Obama. 
and rightly so, after his uh, death in 2014, the refuge was renamed in his honor as the Billy Frank Jr. Nisqually National Wildlife Refuge. And I think that we can really kind of sum up Billy's life and the work of all of the other folks who have dedicated years and years, thousands and thousands of hours to these projects, many other projects that I just flat out don't have time to tell you about. So many fantastic things that have made the Nisqually watershed a real symbol of conservation and preservation. That's a national model that's won awards throughout the United States for the work that folks have done. And I think we can kind of catch all of that if we take a look at one of Billy's most famous quotes. He said, I don't believe in magic. I believe in the sun and the stars, the water, the tides, the floods, the owls, the hawks flying, the river running, the wind talking. They're measurements. They tell us how healthy things are, how healthy we are, because we and they are the same. That's what I believe in. Those who listen to the world that sustains them can hear the message brought forth by the salmon. Before we head into questions and answers, just a quick uh, public service announcements. Uh, if you're interested in a, in a copy of the book, it, they're easy to get. I support your local bookseller, order it from me at my website if you like, or get it online. And uh, if you liked these stories, there's plenty more in Tahoma for you to enjoy. And uh, I do like to tell stories. And every month I publish a blog. I send a new story out uh, to my subscribers. If you're interested in that, uh, be happy to include you on the list. And uh, no strings attached. Don't sell your email address to anybody or anything like that. I just enjoy sharing more stories with folks. So with that, um, I'm ready, if you are, to head into the uh, question and answer portion of our talk today. Uh, Jeff, I think you're really fortunate in that you know you have so much knowledge about the history and native people and native lands in the Northwest. I think you're very, very fortunate. It must be really exciting for you now with the um, all the, the interest and the concern and the people rising up and speaking out for native lands. I personally love it, you know, but I'm kind of a newcomer compared to you. I think about an article that was just in the Seattle Times and it was talking about renaming Mount Rainier to Mount Tahoma. And it talked about how the um, first per white person that came upon the park looked at the mountain and said, and rather than saying, you know, what is, what is that mountain called to the people that were there? He said, you know, that's a beautiful mountain. I'm going to name it after a friend of mine. How presumptuous, right, Jeff? Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's just a crime. Um, and I also am really excited personally because Deborah Holland being the new Department of Interior uh, Secretary is stunning to me. And I think it's exciting. I think it's exciting for the tribes in Washington State and the lands that, that we all um, hike on. So I'm, I just, it's, it's prime time here. I do have a few questions for you, Jeff. Sure. Do you know how tall the Nisqually G Glacier is at the point where the river begins to flow out of it? Oh, like what is the elevation there? Yeah, the depths and, and the, um, how tall is it, the glacier itself? Oh, oh how tall it is. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't, but I'm happy to make something up. <laughs> uh, that, first of all, the elevation that we're at, and I've only been to the terminus of the glacier. I think one time I drug some equipment for some geologists up. They were doing some measurements right there. I think that that is somewhere around 57, 5,800, 5,900 feet right now. Um, I would say, I would just say that right there, that wall, that the toe of the glacier, that terminus, mm -hmm. it's, I mean, I would say, I'm just guessing 100 to 200 feet. Mm -hmm. uh, the Nisqually itself, its thickness at its thickest place is about 300 feet. Mm -hmm. And that really pales in comparison to the carbon, which is the thickest, the carbon glacier is the thickest on the mountain at about 700 feet, it's been measured at mid glacier. So. If that helps. Thank you. Great lead in here. Um, how far up the river do fish 
reach. Oh, do you know so yeah. who's, who's that from? That's a that's, that's a, from Jim Peak. Thanks, Jim. Good question. Yeah. Oh yeah, I, I believe that Jim and I might know each other. And is it possible that Jim is a meadow rover at Mount Rainier National Park? Jim could be. Could be. Yeah. yeah, we'll see. So um, let's see. The so Mon, it's my understanding is that the the, the salmon. Uh, don't go up any higher than the Lagrand Dam. Okay. Even prior to the dams, there was there's a feature called the Nisqually Canyon, where the falls were such that would have prevented the fish from getting up anyway. Now that's not to say there aren't fish in there, that there aren't pre-existing populations. I think there's a bull trout. Isn't there a bull trout population on the Nisqually River? And they're a, a in the trout family, and they're also protected under the Endangered Species Act, like say Chinook salmon. Thank you. A few of your fans who are with us say Jeff's book is a must read if you love Mount Rainier. Others say yes, it is so, and um, it may have been also referring to the bull trout. Another question from a friend: Do you have records of how much the Nisqually get glacier? has receded in recent years. Oh boy, yeah. Yeah, I've seen how much the Emmons has receded. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's kind of frightening. I, I, I don't have it handy, but in my one of my other talks, I have like four different talks that I get on Mount Rainier folks. And one of them really hones in on a lot of the climate change. And in that talk, I have a, a, a drawing, a map that shows the retreat of the Nisqually Glacier since the 1850s. So at that time, it would have extended beyond and past today's Nisqually Road, where the bridge is, it would have extended beyond there. Um, today, we know that the, the where the glacier is, it's retreated about two and a half miles up valley. And in fact, just in my lifetime, it's retreated about a mile. And that image, by the way, which is really easy to understand, is in Tahoma. It's in the Nisqually River chapter. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let um, me see if there's other things. Um, have I already restored some estuary to the north of the river? This was during the presentation. So, um, and Billy Frank's statue, here's another sub question. Billy Frank's statue will be one of two representing Washington State at the National Capitol. Yeah. Interesting. Yep. So um, hasn't the tribe also restored some estuary to the north of the river? To the north? Yes. What is that's called the Braggett Marsh, right? And, and again, I mean, what, what can I wedge into? What can I wedge into 30 minutes? <laughs> uh, the 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 Braggett, the Braggett Marsh is a is a great tribal project. Also, you might be familiar with the Oha Creek project right outside of Eatonville. That's an amazing story, and that that even ended up on the cutting room floor. But that was a Swedish dairyman came into the Eatonville area, uh, straightened Ohop Creek, took the meander out of it, straightened Ohop Creek, made great farming smashed all the Samanid populations. And then the tribe in the early 2000s restored that historic meander to Ohop Creek, put in some engineered log jams, and now the salmon numbers are coming back. So that's uh, just another great restoration story that the tribe has really had their hands in. Thank you. That rounds things out, Jeff. Do you wait? Hold on. We have one more and we're OK on time. Yep. OK. Hold on just a sec. What did, did you do as a ranger at Rainier in oh, those few years? Yeah, yeah. actually, I, I didn't work as a ranger, but I worked uh, mostly with the trail crews. And back in the day, we had something called the, the U.S. Youth Conservation Corps. Some of you who are, are, are older might remember that. And I helped run Youth Conservation Corps camps out of Longmire for a couple of years, including running their trail crews. That's so great. Jeff, thank you as always. And everyone, be sure to check out his site and, and purchase his book. Everyone that has read it, I have not yet, but I'm looking forward to it. it. Says great things, Jeff. So all that knowledge, all those days that you spent up on the mountain is uh, touching many, many minds. So thank you for sharing Good. your wisdom with us. Uh, we'll be back in June with another uh, virtual field trip. 
And just so you know, we awarded more than uh, $650,000 during last year's COVID year to the national parks. Um, our field trip just keep going. It's been over like almost a year and a half. Uh, keep an eye out on our e-news if you get that and on our website. If you want to sign up for our e-news, please do reach out to any of us. We'll help you if you need assistance. Uh, let's see, visit WNPF to learn more. And with that, just, you know, kind of a flat hat salute to you, Jeff, for, for being with us and for sharing your knowledge. And we're very grateful. So thank great. you, everyone, for being with us today. Have thank a great you. afternoon. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you.